But the point of my talk is actually that we need to come to terms with the fact that home is no longer about here or there. Home is about everywhere. It's not simply a matter that we understand that we all share this single beautiful planet or even the idea that what goes around comes around. It's about the fact that everywhere is here. And here is everywhere, now. And that it's a good thing when it comes to trying to figure out slow solutions to the big global problems that we face. It used to be common to say about a person that they held the world in the palm of their hands. And we used to say that metaphorically. But you know, as we meet here today, there are more than 700 million individual cell phone subscribers in Africa. And that's set to grow by another 20% next year. So it's no longer a metaphor. It's real. People all over the world do hold the world in the palm of their hands, and it's making a huge difference and it signals the depth and potential of the challenge and opportunity that is upon us. It's not just about technology. It's about how we understand ourselves and how we recognize the global issues and responsibilities that are around us as ours. The thing that concerns me is poverty. And I believe that we're at a pivotal moment in our ability to seriously address that fundamental issue as a global community. The moment is that the agenda that has been driving international development for the past two decades, which is called the Millennium Development Goals, which were adopted by the UN in 2000, will expire within a couple of years. And so the question is before us, what will, or rather what should, replace them? The global conversation to figure that out has been launched by the UN Secretary General. Uh, I'd like to, you to consider yourself to have now been invited into that conversation. And it's a conversation that matters because for the first time, this conversation will not be about them, the poor, but it will be about us, humanity. And it will directly effect, the outcome of this conversation will directly affect everyone in this room and our children and our grandchildren. Now, while they've had shortcomings, those Millennium Development Goals, and there's eight of them, and for short they're called MDGs, have represented an important achievement in a number of respects. The first one being that they exist at all. The MDGs represent the very first time in human history that all countries agreed and committed to support a single shared agenda, a single shared set of priorities for addressing poverty throughout the world. And it wasn't just a thing that was about, you know, nice words on a diplomatic statement, but they got behind it not only governments, but also civil society, NGOs, people throughout the world with political will and dollars and a commitment to act. And I know that because during the years that I lived here in Penticton, before moving off to Ottawa, a lot of what I was doing was actually negotiating some of those agreements and chasing down signatures on checks. Uh, secondly, sorry, those MDGs are important because they were concrete commitments to concrete targets to save lives and to incubate change. 
The goals are, and there's, as I say, eight of them, really concrete and really ambitious. They were to reduce, by 2015, all of these, to reduce by half the number of people suffering from hunger around the world. To enable all children everywhere to be able to complete primary school. To eliminate gender discrimination in access to schools everywhere. To reduce child mortality by more than two-thirds and maternal mortality by 75% to stop the spread of HIV AIDS, to cut by 50% the proportion of people who are living without access to clean water, and to create, finally, a new global partnership to create a fair global economy. Ambitious, indeed. And the third reason that these Millennium De Development Goals are important is because there has been some real achievement in, in realizing each and every one of them. This is a good news story, folks. During the time that this has been in operation, so since basically the mid-90s and today, there has been, the bottom line is that the proportion of children, women, and men around the globe who are living in extreme poverty has shrunk from almost one half, just under one half in the mid-1990s, to just over one quarter today. That's an incredible achievement. Now, and a sea change in terms of the health and well-being and experience of our family. But of course, the size of that human family has also grown, and the environmental pressures that we are, our planet is facing have also increased during that time, which means there's still a hell of a lot of poverty in the world, and the MDG commitments end in 2015. So, where do we go from here? I believe that the best clue is provided by Millennium Development Goal number eight, that one about creating a global partnership. It's the one that has been most ignored and that is never included in any of the assessments about progress because people have not wanted to go there because it represents fundamental change in our political and cultural and social structure going forward. Gandhi said, that poverty is the worst form of violence. And we know something else to be true as well. That violence is the main and most persistent product of poverty. Although it seems obvious, only rarely have we dealt with these two things, human rights and development, or poverty and violence, together in an integrated manner. War and conflict create poverty. But poverty, in and of itself, never creates war. Poverty only creates death and despair and more poverty. War and violence results from situations where poverty is experienced not simply as a great suffering or as a, a dark tragedy, but as something that is fundamentally unfair when it is seen and felt to be the result of discrimination or social, political, and economic exclusion. That is when it generates violence. In fact, it's precisely this kind of deprivation that's grounded in discrimination and disparity that has been the principal cause of the wars and conflicts of the past 25 years and of the further poverty that has been created as a result. Or we could flip the idea around and look at it from the point of view of well-being and happiness. And we can see the inverse. Countries that have suffered terrible conflict and poverty, but which have taken seriously and have been supported to rebuild their societies on the basis of advancing human rights, protecting gender equality, 
and, advan and, and emphasizing the inclusion of women and marginalized groups have experienced the greatest increases in prosperity. Just consider the, which countries have experienced the highest rates of economic growth during the past year, this year, but it's the same ones for the past five years. It's almost the same ones for the past 10 years. So we all know that on that top 20 list will be India and China. But, and it doesn't, it's not our usual image, however, the fact is that the largest number of countries in the top 20 are in Africa. Notably, these are countries that have experienced major civil wars and even genocide. You can see Rwanda, for example, on that list in the 1990s, but, ch but which have gone through and been committed to a reconciliation process and a reconstruction process focused on exactly the things that I was referring to, human rights and inclusion. And if we add some of the other countries in other parts of the world, which have also had that same experience, then the top tier of economic growth of the past five years is almost complete. But during the past five years, not only has the location of economic growth changed, so also has the nature of poverty, and in some fundamental ways. First, it has become globalized, as inequality and exclusion has grown and spread in many societies, including our own. The majority of the world's poor actually now live in what are called middle-income societies, especially those that are marked by, by the most extreme levels of social inequality, such as Colombia, Peru, Honduras. And secondly, the face of poverty is increasingly being shaped by climate change which is expected to directly claim about 100 million lives over the course of the next two decades, more than HIV AIDS. If we don't take seriously these challenges, disparity, inequality, and climate change, then these will become the sources of increasing social conflict and may unleash a new cycle of extreme poverty in our world. We don't know what will replace the Millennium Development Goals as the new priorities for international development after 2015. But that discussion has been launched and it has the potential to be the most important conversation for this generation. Because this time it will not simply about the so-called rich or developed countries telling what they'll do to help the so-called poor or underdeveloped countries. It will be about setting the shape for the world we want, which is what the Secretary General of the UN has named this task. This conversation that has already begun in over 100 countries around the world, but sadly not in our own, at least not until today. I think it's likely that the new priorities will not so much be about specific technical goals and targets, although I hope that they will build upon the experience of the MDGs. I think they'll be more about the qualities and approach that needs to characterize our responses to the challenges of international development. Actually, let's forget about that term, international development, and instead, let's make this conversation simply one where we start speaking about the kind of project that we can all have a hand in, creating a more just, peaceful and decent world for everyone, everywhere, that the world that we all want. My hope is that the new priorities will focus on a few key things, such as sustainability, an approach to development that emphasizes empowerment and solidarity, that recognizes strengths as well as needs, and that works to assist local communities to develop their own potential and realize their own solutions to poverty, injustice, and environmental challenges. Inclusion, an approach to poverty that is based not only on measures of deprivation, but also on the critical factors of discrimination and disparity. An approach that will focus especially on enhancing the participation and place of women and youth. 
and partnership, an approach that invites and engages all social and economic forces to contribute to building real and lasting solutions to the challenges we all face and increasingly that we will all share. This is the stuff, I believe, of culture change, and some may feel that it's a tad idealistic. Uh, maybe so, but those who know me know that I'm a pretty pragmatic person. I've lived my life in a caring but pretty hard-edged world, one that is familiar with the sharp and sore reality of hunger and war, as well as familiar with the shining and inspiring reality of the dedication and daring to do something about it. Okay, so it is idealistic, but the bottom line is that idealism doesn't ma make it any less necessary. Like most things that are real, the need for such fundamental and global change will force itself upon us whether we like it or not. That's why this conversation about the world we want needs to matter in real terms to everyone, everywhere, even here with us. So, welcome home. Idealist or not, it doesn't matter so much what we believe or which words we use. It matters what we do. Each of us and all of us, here and everywhere. It would be great if we could do it together and I thought that one thing that we could do together would be to start that conversation today. So on Monday, this doesn't exist yet, I just thought of it, uh, we'll create a new website. And I'd be interested to have you join with me in this conversation of building the world we want. We'll do that together and see what we generate and send off to our government and the UN in the next few months. Thank you very much for your hospitality. <laughs>